No? How about that? It says it's on. No? Okay. Maybe I can speak loud enough. How about that? All right. Uh, I, as you could tell, uh, Lyle gave it away. I'm not Bobby. I'm not Wes. Uh, they, uh, they asked me to speak, and this is not part of the gospel series. I know the email they sent out was kind of a covert uh, mistruth, right? So to get you to come. So but anyway, it, it actually it's an open spot in the schedule, and uh, they asked if I would speak. Uh, I did not come to this with anything on my heart, but I started praying about it a couple months ago when he asked me. And um, actually, I officiated a wedding last uh, last weekend, and I did a funeral yesterday. Or no, I'm sorry, Friday. And then uh, uh, I'm not sure if you've heard of him before, a guy named General Steiner, Carl Steiner, passed away about a week and a half ago, I guess, in La Follette, is that how you pronounce it? He was 85, he was a general, and I worked for him at Fort Bragg for a number of years. Got me to thinking about life in general. You know, here you've got a wedding with some people that uh, are getting ready to embark on a new stage of their life, uh, you know, possibly have kids, travel, do all kinds of things, and then over here I've got people that are finishing the cycle of life. This gets you to thinking, and, uh, you know, as I prayed about it and it came to me, the Holy Spirit kind of clarified it a little bit, and the question I kept asking myself is, how has my walk been? How has my walk been up to this point? What's it going to look like from this point moving forward? So um, thus today's sermon title I've just come up with, Does My Walk Match My Talk? Does Our Walk Match Our Talk? And, uh, you know, inevitably you've got to go back to the day you were saved. The night, the day, the time you were saved, when you were reborn. And just think about that for a second. For everybody in here, it's all, it's all different. When, you, when some of you got saved, you jumped up on the wall, right? You wanted to scream, shout, tell everybody about it. Some of you cried. Some of you didn't do anything, right? It just felt good inside. So it's all different, but think about that for a second. The day you got saved, the night you got saved, the time you got saved, what was it like? Now, that's the pivotal point. Think about the before, and then now think about the after. Okay, the before, whew, walking in darkness, right? now walking in light. One would dare say now it's a little tougher, possibly, right? It's hard. It's hard walking in that new light. Let me read this to you real quick. I kind of like this, uh, this synopsis here. It's, and you don't have to turn. You can listen. Some of this is not going to be on the screen because I've got a lot of scripture here. I'm not going to try to read all of it but in case I need to reference it. But out of Titus 3, it's uh, verses 3 through 8. It says, For once, I'm sorry, for we also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. But when the kindness of our God, our Savior, and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly, through Christ, Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by His grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy statement. And considering these things, I want you to speak confidently so that those who have believed God will be careful to engage in good deeds. These things are good and profitable for men. Kind of captures it, doesn't it? I like that. Not a lot of people, you know, talk about Titus. It's just a small book, right? But that's some powerful, powerful stuff right there. We were once foolish. We were once disobedient. We did those things. The, the, the thrust here is, is that, you know, only thing that we brought to the table when God called us is our sin. That's all we brought. Doesn't matter how much work we've done out here. Doesn't matter how many dollar club projects we... Uh, sponsor and fulfill it doesn't matter what we brought to the table is not good enough only out of God's mercy and grace and love were we saved so if that's the case this living that we're supposed to be doing i.e. our walk should be the best we've got for him uh, agree not agree maybe at least one amen somewhere okay all right in Ephesians 5 8 it says for you were formerly 
darkness. Now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. So, it comes back to the question, are we walking as children of the light? Does the world that we interact in, that we live in, that we walk through, can people tell by our life that we are children of the light? Or are we walking around with baskets over us? Blankets around us? Something to think about. And, you know, when I was getting ready to do this, just to kind of throw this out there to let you know that I just didn't come up with the word walk, I um, started looking through some Bible translations, different ones, CSB, NSAB, you know, uh, King James Version, all that stuff. But anyway, just doing the word search in the NA, NASB, uh, 368 times walk appears in the Old Testament and New Testament. 281 of those in the Old Testament, 87 in the New. So I thought, okay, let's do the CSB because we do that, we reference that here a lot. 398 instances. So you can, you can see throughout the Bible, walk, walking, some form of it, is mentioned and I'll just give you I'm going to kind of take you on a little car ride here so just bear with me don't worry about flipping over but starting in the Old Testament just some highlights Genesis 7 17, 17 1 now when Abram was 99 years old the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him I am God Almighty walk before me and be blameless Genesis 5 22 through 24 I won't read it all but it's about Enoch right we all remember that so all the days of Enoch were 300 and 65 years, Enoch walked with God, and he was not where God took him. Genesis 6, 9. These are the records of the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his time. Noah walked with God. Okay, see, what, see the gist here, right? We're getting all these examples of people walking with the Lord. And then you can kind of come into Psalm, and Psalm talks about a few things, uh, you know, walking in the fear of the Lord, walking in his ways, being walking uprightly, etc., and then one of the famous ones that everybody's heard before is Micah 6, 8. He has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Then we move into the New Testament. And in Romans, I, like, I use the CSB translation here because I like how it starts out. Romans 13, 13, it says, Let us walk with decency, not arrogance, not selfishness, let us walk with decency as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual impur uh, impurity and promiscuity, not in quarreling and jealousy. And then in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, it says, we walk by faith, not by what? Sight, right. And then in Galatians, but I say walk by the Spirit. And then finally in Ephesians 4, 1 through 3, I'm not going to read it all, but it says, therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you, to walk in a manner worthy, worthy of the calling with which you have been called, etc., etc. Worthy. So, here we've got, you know, you look through the Bible, you see the word walk in there a lot. You know, uh, he walked, he was blamed as upright, etc., etc. So, we've got examples of what that looks like in the Old Testament. But if you notice, we don't get a lot of examples in the New Testament. What we get is guidance, our instructions. Here's how they did it. And oh, by the way, they didn't have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit like we do. They did not have the Bible and the complete works that we do. So here is your guidelines. Here's what I need you to do. Here's your goal. Here's what you strive for. Fair enough? And, you know, like I said, in the Old Testament, you see the descriptions of blameless, fearing, righteously, uprightly, and humbly. New Testament, our guidance, walk in the light. Walk in the newness of life. Walk with decency. Walk by faith. Walk with the Spirit. Walk in a manner worthy. Worthy. That word keeps coming up. It's come up a few times in the Scriptures. Kind of gives you an idea of trying to match up, right? You know, phew, man, I hope I'm worthy enough. I hope they pick me. You know, I, you know, uh, I love that. Anybody seen the Charles Barkley commercial with the picking teams? A little kid, you know. Oh, oh, we picked me. Yeah, you know. I hope I'm worthy. Right? The little kids are like, oh, great. I just I love that. That's what I thought of. But, you know, this matching up, we've got to be careful with this, too. Worthy, really, what that means is, is it's our outward behavior and our daily life should be matching our inward convictions. It's that simple. It's not some kind of a merit system, okay? We, we are to honor God. He has a plan for us, and our honor should be 
walking in a manner worthy so he can complete his sanctification process of us, right? Everybody, everybody tracking with that. So, and uh, let me throw out this one out here to another good one. First of all, uh, in, let me go back. In Ephesians, it says, walk in a manner worthy of the calling, okay? And then in Colossians 1, 9, I'm not going to read it all. It says, so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. So here we go. We got to, you need to wor- walk in the manner worthy of what you were called. And oh, by the way, you need to walk in a manner worthy of God. Whew, man, this is getting tough. I can't, I, you know, I got too many standards and stuff here. I, I'm, I'm going to do one thing at a time, right? That's kind of what we want to say sometimes. It's not that hard. And we're going to see why in a minute. But bottom line is, is our creator, and I can't stress this enough, folks, our creator who saved us when we brought nothing to the table but our pure, unadulterated sin loved us enough that he still accepted us, right? Man. If I think it's something to be praising and jumping up and down about, because I am not worthy at that point of anything. But through his grace and love, he still accepted me and he accepted you. Praise to God. Now, in that Colossians uh, chapter 1, 9 through 13, it, you know, it's a long section there, but there's four areas it talks about in, in relation to worthy. Being fruitful in every good work. Steadily increasing in the knowledge of God using the power of God to joyfully endure and patiently persevere, and giving thanks to the Father of what he has done. Giving thanks. Giving thanks. Count thy blessings. Right? I think that's what the song we were just singing. Now, I didn't tell them right to play these songs either. I'm coming in here this morning meeting with, with the band. I'm like, oh, that kind of fits in there. That sounds pretty good. Thank you, Holy Spirit. So we have our instructions, and you know, okay, I got the short hair, I got it, right? You know, so we got our marching orders, right? I got through that army lingo in there. We got our marching orders. How are we supposed to walk worthy? Um, as I said before, and I, I like we also reflect about this, how many times have you got caught up in believing this is a metric performance thing? I've been in church every day for a year now. I mean, every Sunday, right? Perfect attendance. Whew. Lord loves me. Yeah, huh? yeah, yeah. Don't laugh. <laughs> yeah, no, please laugh because it is funny, right? You know, I pray every morning at six o'clock. Every morning, don't miss it. <sighs> huh? D- true or false? Plug in whatever that <laughs> that issue is that you do, and if you're not careful, there's times that you'll rationalize to yourself that I'm doing pretty darn good for God, right? Where's my gold star at? Can I get a check mark up on the board there? Can I get recessed today? Right? We do that. Okay, the first of all, you need to remember this. God doesn't hate us because we do that. He knows that we're human. But we cannot earn this on our own. We can't walk with God on our own. He wants us to be totally dependent on Him in everything. And... It, <laughs> You know, Paul, when he's talking to the Colossians here in, uh, in, in chapter 1, basically what he's doing is he's saying, look, God is more interested in your relationship with him, not in what you're doing or, or, or experiencing or trying to do. He's, a, he's more interested in that relationship. He is, Paul is exhorting us to prove, basically, by our actions and our walk that we belong to Christ. Another question for you to think on. Nobody needs to raise their hand and answer this. But how many times have you been around somebody? You don't know them. There's something about them. The way they go, the way they talk, the way they do things, you're like, and then something just gives it away. And you're like, ah, they're, they're a Christ follower. Wow. I figured, so I could tell. You see what I'm saying? So my question is, is some, can somebody do that with you? We're called to live with integrity. Display the fruit of the Spirit. And our daily lives should match the gospel message, our position in Christ, and more importantly, the character of Christ. Are we talking about our religion? Are we uh, professing it? Are we living it? That's really what it comes down to. And, um, you know, I also put down here 
couple things about our walk. Are we consistent with it and are we persevering with it? I.e., number one, we're walking with the Lord. How many of us have a tendency to wander off? You know? Oh, job, my kids. Oh, next thing you know, you're walking off the path. God's like, what are you doing? Oh, sorry, I'll be right back. How many times, and this is a good one, do we hurry ahead of the Lord? Ah, God, I'll take care of it. I'll be right back. I'm going to clear the path for you a little bit. All right? I'm going to do this for you, Lord. The Lord's like, ah, rolling his eyes, I bet, right? How about, and this is another good one, if it hits home, sorry. Sometimes we show up and go with a little stroll with the Lord, then don't, we don't see him again for a month. Sometimes a year, sometimes years. And what's even more heartbreaking is, is sometimes we stop and quit because it's too hard. I didn't sign up for this. I didn't sign up for the world to hate me because I say that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins and loves me, etc., etc., and the world hates me because I say that. I didn't sign up for this. I didn't sign up for that. Well, okay. I'm just not going to walk with you anymore, Lord, because it's too tough. It's hard. Wow, what a shame. What a shame. Because as you all know, when you've read in Scripture, it tells us, what did Jesus say? They, they hate me first, right? They're going to hate you too. And then what's Peter say? Why are you surprised about this for? It's going to happen. Why are you surprised? So, I'll take a little side note here. By the way, preaching is just reminding, okay? We have the truth in God's Word. Some of y'all sat through 100 million sermons, right? You've heard this before. But the thing about being human is we need, we need to be reminded. So that's really what we're doing today is reminding us, ourselves of this stuff. But, you know, we're too busy. We want to do it ourselves. It's inconvenient. I'm tired. And I've got other things to do. I'm too busy. Lord, I'll, I'll, I'll come walk with you tomorrow, I promise. But I need to take care of this. No. No. Tell yourself no. Find a way to remind yourself no. That is not the way to go about this walk. Okay? And it's, it's a constant communion. It's a consistent pattern. But here's the thing. It's a disciplined and purposeful approach. It's not something on the lark. Okay? Something, hmm, yeah, I'll do it tomorrow. Yeah, no, it's purposeful. You have to make the decision. I'm going to do this. So I'll go back to the very first of what I was talking about. Here I'm seeing people die. You know, I'm seeing people get married and starting a new life. And I'm like, wow, wow, wow. I'm looking at me and I'm like, good gosh. See, I did this. I did, mm, mm, did that. And I'm not too embarrassed. I'm not too proud of it. I'm not actually going to tell anybody about that. But I did all these things. And um, so this thing is falling off me. Evangeline, can you hear me or not? Evangeline, I'm sorry. Not, can you hear this? Oh, now you can. Wow, I can hear that now. Okay. Sorry. But when we're, and I like to think about this here. If you don't walk with God right now, but when trouble comes, who are we going to run to? Right? Now think about that. I ain't got time for you today, God, but all of a sudden the waters rise, the clouds, you know, get dark, trouble comes around. Whew, Lord, how can you trust him when you've not even given him the opportunity to teach you and guide you and grow you. Plus, number two, if you've been walking with him before, maybe not, that might not be as bad a storm as you think. Right? So we've got to walk with him before those times come. But here's some things I want to talk about too. There's, uh, and, and I know I'm kind of driving around the park a lot. I apologize for that. But in this walk, there's three things we need to think about. Are we really walking with the one true God? And I'm gonna, I'll get to that here in a second. Number two, are we attempting to walk, as I said, through our own self-effort and our own merit? And number three, the path you will walk with God is totally different than the one that you walked before you saved. Okay? Keep those three there. Matthew 24, 24, it says... 
For false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders, so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. First Timothy 4.1 says, But the Spirit explicitly says that in later times some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. Are we walking with the one true God? We've got to be certain of that. And I kind of got to thinking about this too. We've got to be careful we don't deceive ourselves. And here's what I mean by that. Okay, I got, I got all the occult and mysticism and this and that and yada, yada, yada. I'm not talking about that right now. Have we caught up sometimes in the idea and concept of Jesus? And that's what we're trying to find and get close to, a principle, a concept? Or do we actually have that relationship with Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit? You see what I'm getting at? I think sometimes we might get deceived and think, well, I'm in this small group. I have that Bible study going on, and I'm doing this, and I got these studies, and yada, yada, yada. Well, that's all great and fine, because I d- it just said earlier that we need to increase in, w- in the knowledge of the Word of God. I got that. But it's all based off the premise and foundational element of, do you have a relationship with Christ? If you don't, this is all for naught. Are we walking with the one true God? Are we? We have to know that, and the only way we know that is through assurance by the Holy Spirit. And you will know that. You can raise your hand and say amen if you want to, but when you were saved, did you not feel the change inside? I did. Now, I wasn't one of the ones that climbed up off the wall and went, yeah, you know, all this stuff, right? But I felt it. If you felt it, you know what I'm talking about. If you didn't feel it, I don't know. Maybe we need to talk. Maybe we need to pray. Maybe, I don't know. But you will feel it. The Holy Spirit tells us in Scripture it will give you assurance. It will give you assurance. And like I said, people will get caught up in studies and, and this and that and kind of lose sight of the fact it's about the relationship. Uh, they know the plan, but they don't know the man. I've heard that before. Sound pretty good? Yeah. I didn't write that, but I like it. In 1 John 1, 6, it says, If we say we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. That's pretty tough stuff if you think about it. I'm, I'm a Christ follower. I love Jesus Christ. Yeah, I was, I, yep, good to go. But everything else besides your talk is diametrically opposed to that. It's like C.S. Lewis said, you have to look at the behavior before and after the point of supposed conversion. If there's no difference, one must suppose there was no conversion. I didn't say it. C.S. Lewis did. Sounds pretty good. So, and then in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and I know I'm beating the drum on this, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of work, so that no one may boast. Are we walking in faith and dependence upon God or are we wasting our energy on our efforts to impress, to gain his favor, to gain his love instead of just releasing ourselves to him to be empowered? That's the question. We talk about being born again, the conversion, everybody, you know, the different words there, but we're reborn, we see things, we feel things. And if you go back and look at Romans 10, that's one thing that I've always talked about too. We don't need to, it's not that hard. If you're not saved and you're not a Christ follower, it's not that hard. There's no confirmation and swinging of this and water, whatever. Go read Romans 10, okay? And it says, if you believe in your heart, profess with your mouth, call upon the Lord. Okay, it's very simple. But you go back and read that, the first thing it says is believe in your heart. Not here, in your heart. Now, of course, we know this comes along with it, but the key thing here is the heart. This is not an academic pursuit. This is a real relational pursuit. So we walk in dependence, and we're not deceived. Uh, and, okay, it's not in here, got, but I've got to go with what the Holy Spirit's saying. You've got people out there that don't understand this walk we're talking about. They struggle to understand Christianity. They don't understand it. They think we're crazy, right? 
you know, Kool-Aid, right? Whatever. They think that. They don't get this. But the thing about it is, is well, the Holy Spirit has to draw them to the Lord. And when the Holy Spirit does, then that revelation happens and they have a choice to make. We need to make sure that our walk doesn't hinder that process, okay? Because if they do, I mean, think about it. We're becoming an obstacle. We've got to walk in dependence on the Lord. We've got to walk in the Spirit, in submission, humbly, yielding, growing, maturing, but also doing what? Stumbling, falling, tripping up, right? I, don't, I wore my good pants today, but I got a lot of holes in the knees of others because I fall down a lot. We're not perfect. This walk that we talk about, yeah, the grand standards and the parameters and everything, yes, I got it. But who seriously in this room is 100% perfect with that? I'm not. And here's where Satan comes in. Satan will come in and deceive you and go, oh, you can't even walk with the Lord the way you're supposed to. What good are you? And try to get you depressed, right? Get you swirled up, ineffective, then you're no good. Eh, get behind me. God knows I'm not perfect. I've got my goals to shoot for. He's with me. The Holy Spirit's guiding, directing me, empowering me. I get up, dust myself off, and keep going. That's the key. We don't stop. We don't quit. That's the key. We continue to shake off that dust. And as I said earlier, the, uh, the things to consider, the last thing was is we walk a different path. I won't read the whole section here, but you all, you all know this. Romans 12, 1 and 2, it says, Therefore, I urge you, brethren, you know, da, da, it says, and Do not be conformed to this world. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. We're going to walk the narrow way now. You, you know, I always talk, you know, I talk to some of the former students of mine, I always kind of, you know, give an example, but, you know, you're standing there on the sidelines and you're watching the teams play. Well, God, Jesus, Holy Spirit said, hey, you want to play for us? Yeah, I'll put on New Jersey. Well, guess what? You're going to play in a different game on a different team now. You're going to walk down the narrow road. The world is walking down the wide road, correct? But the narrow gate and the narrow road, that is your walk with Christ. Now, I kind of want to get into this other part here real quick. First of all, I understand, you know, walking with the Lord, there are so many ways you can go with this and look at this, but I just want to show you what was laid upon my heart. You know, the, you know, like I said before, you got the weddings, funerals, thinking about this, what do I look like, What's, what have I done, what am I going to do, et cetera, et cetera. And we just finished up uh, our job evaluation, you know, job performance evaluations at work, right? You have to do those every year. And our teachers to do the annual thing, you know, and got to do your goals. And, okay, how did I do? How did I do? Well, that kind of got me thinking, how do I look at my life? How do I assess it as far as my Christian walk goes? Now, I, I just said this is not about checks and minuses and numbers and I you know, scored this or this. I got that. But still, there's somehow we need to look at how we're doing. And for me, this is just me. I'm offering up to you. I look at three things uh, overall. In, it's the G, R, and the S. The giving, the receiving, and the sharing. I just broke it up into three things. And, I, and let me break it down here for you. On the giving part, we, in our walk, should be giving God our complete focus, giving Him our obedience, giving Him our attention, our tithing, our worship, our time, our praise, our love. You see where I'm going here. We should be giving God what He deserves. He created us. We should be giving Him praise, honor, and glory, and all these other things, at all times, not just on Sunday, not just on Tuesday small group, Wednesday small group, or Thursday small group. Every single day, does my walk match my talk? We give to God every single day. And, you know, it's not, and I know you've heard this, I know, like I said before, this is just reminding, okay? But we don't give Him our second best or our hand me downs. 
We give him the best always. Because think about it. Does he not deserve it? Right? He sent his son to die on a cross and become sin for me. I don't know how else to repay that. Now, what do these examples look like in the giving realm of our walk? Like I said, there's not a cookie-cutter template here for everybody, okay? I'm just giving you some examples that come to my mind. How you assess your walk, that's between you and God. But things that come to my mind, daily prayer. Am I going to, do I have a continuous conversation with God every day? Or is it that I get up and go, okay, I got 10 minutes. Lord, I love you. Give me this, help me with that, guide me here, and amen, walk out the door. And I don't talk to him again for 24 hours. If that's, I'm not judging, I'm not criticizing, but is that your, is that your prayer life? Worse, is it just once a week on Sunday? Or, and I know we've talked, you know, in small group of stuff, man, you're, you're having a conversation as soon as you get out of bed. Lord, thank you for getting that sleep, you know, and, and you're just talking to God all day. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's what God wants. Imperfect or not, He wants that kind of relationship with you. Number two, your daily Bible reading. Do we do that? That's hard. Can't find the time. Work, kids, this, that, da 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 da. Well, guess what? If you don't read God's Word, you're not going to be reminded. And if you're not reminded, the walk gets a little stale, so to speak. You see what I'm saying? We've got to read, read, read God's line, well, His Word. And we cultivate an attitude of gratitude, striving for obedience, regular church attendance, small group, order, making the effort. That's really what it boils down to. We should focus on God with everything that we have, give Him our best. And when you fix your thoughts on God, He'll fix your thoughts. Give you just a couple of scripture, we'll move on. In Psalm 150, 1 through 2, one, it says, Praise the Lord, praise God in sanctuary, praise Him in His mighty expanse. Praise Him for His mighty, praise Him, praise Him. Give God your praise, He deserves it, He is worthy of it. Number 2, Colossians 3, 1 through 3, it says, Therefore, if you've been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above, where Christ is seated at the right. Set your mind on things above. Give Him your focus. Not on things on earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. 1 Peter 1, 13 through 16. Therefore, prepare your minds for action, keep in service spirit. Fix your hope completely. The word fix, look. Seek. And then I'm going to move on down here to 2 Timothy 2, 15. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed after him the word of truth. Are we striving to give God our best? So the first part of my assessment of my walk is, is how does my giving look? And it's not just back there in the giving box. It's not how much I serve on cutting yards or visiting the elderly or doing whatever. It's not just that. It's all of it. Are we giving God our best? If we're not, let's remind ourselves somehow. Let's be purposeful and figure out how to give. Number two, second part of this, receiving. Okay, what, what, what are we talking about here? Now I'm getting ready to preach some prosperity gospel, right? No, no, I'm not preaching that. But if we give God our best, now listen, we give him our best and we submit, we yield, we're humble, then here's what we're going to receive. Wisdom, instruction, peace, discernment, correction, exhortation, Comfort, forgiveness, blessings, fellowship. Boom, 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 boom. Boy, that's an endless checking account you can draw from. But you've got to give first before you can receive, right? What do we have a habit of doing as Americans in our culture? Lord, I love you. Could you help me with these bills? Lord, I love you. Could you help me with this? Could you help? We're always asking. And don't get me wrong. God wants us to come and depend on him and ask him, but we need to give to him first. We need to give him our love, our praise, our devotion. That's what he wants. It's that sweet aroma that he's missing. He loves that. Okay? He's not a vending machine. When we're thirsty, drop in some quarters. No. That's not it. So we receive if we give. And that receiving part, that's the spirit of the unity and purpose coming together. 
people together, and now we can start fulfilling his purpose. Everyday examples of receiving. Okay, this is just what comes in my head. When you pray, do you pray your will or his will? Sounds nice. We say all these things. and say, I pray that your will be done, Lord, in Jesus Christ's name, amen. Is it kind of a catchphrase that you use, or do you mean that? Something to think about. Do you believe and exercise your faith? Here's one that I struggle with. Are you, are you teachable? Are you too proud? Are you too selfish? Are you teachable? The Holy Spirit will not force it on you. Are we willing and receptive? Are we too stubborn and self-righteous? Are we sensitive? How are we doing on time? All right, I'm going to read through this real quick. Got to get through, got to get going. Proverbs 2.11, it's a good summary. Uh, my son, if you'll receive my words and treasure, if you will receive my words and treasure my commandments within you, make your ear attentive to wisdom, incline your heart to understanding. For if you cry for discernment, lift your voice for understanding. If you seek, th- you'll get this. Proverbs 2, 1 through 11, you get it. If you receive. And then in James 1, 5, we all know this one. But if you lacks wisdom, right? Ask the Lord. He gives generously. First John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is what? Faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins. We receive that. Second Corinthians, and God is able to make all grace abound to you so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance of every good deed. God did not say anywhere in Scripture that I want you to be poor, hungry, and live on the street. Does he say that? No, he doesn't. Conversely, he doesn't say, I want you to be a billionaire and live in a 40-room mansion on the hill. He doesn't say that either. This life we live, we live individually in relation to him according to his purpose, but we can only do that if we submit, we yield, and we're willing, and we're giving. That way we can receive. You see how this is all flowing, okay? And then, last, I had to throw it in there, too, uh, Revelation 3.19, those, to those, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Uh, Proverbs 3.11 says the same thing. Uh, my son, do not reject the discipline of the Lord or loathe his reproof for whom the Lord loves, he reproves. Uh, you know, don't get discipline, correction mixed up with punishment, okay? When you accept Christ as your Savior and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit happens, you are now chosen one. Elect, saint, ambassador, child of God, right? Whatever title that that is good for you, you are now adopted into that family. God does not punish you. He corrects you. He disciplines you. There's a big difference. And like we talked before, instead of asking why, ask what? Lord, what are you trying to teach me here? What did I do wrong? Educate me so I won't do it again. Instead of going, why? Why? Do we not hear a lot of that today? Why? No, we need to ask the question, what? All right, I'm going to move on. Uh, A.W. Tozer uh, says in his book, The Pursuit of God, we must simplify our approach to him. We must strip down to the essentials, and they will be found to be blessedly few. We must put away all effort to impress and come with him with the guileless candor of childhood. If we do this, without doubt, God will respond. When we give God our best, we'll receive his best. He won't withhold it. Last thing. So here's my walk. How am I grading this thing? Yeah. I Probably a C on some days with giving. Maybe a B plus on some days, right? And then we got the receiving. Uh, kind of the same, maybe. Okay, the next one. Last one. Share. We're giving God our best in all things. All the time, the best we can. He, in turn, has given us his best because he's promised it. But there's another thing as part of this walk. We have a responsibility, and that's called sharing. We've got to share Christ. We've got to share the gospel. We need to share our story with others. Okay, well, hold on a sec here. No, there's no need to hold on. Right here, Matthew 28, 18. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Let's see, let me make sure I'm reading this right. 
Go therefore and preach. No, wait a minute. Go therefore and set the example. No, it doesn't say that. It says make, exa- it says make disciples. That's a whole other sermon. The point here is, as I asked earlier, can somebody tell that you're a Christ follower just by watching you live? By your actions, by your words? If not, I don't know. Maybe we need to get, you get your assessment sheet out and figure out what the, what the deal is. But even in Luke, it says, And he was saying to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out labor. Harvest is plentiful. What are we doing? And don't sit here and think I'm fussing at you. I'm not. When I point a finger three or back at me, right? So this is, I'm reminding myself today. So why don't we do the share business? Jesus said, they hate me, they're going to hate you. So why, why don't we do this? Are we afraid? Yeah, I, I say we are sometimes. We don't like to be rejected, socially isolated, et cetera, et cetera. It happens, right? Now, bear with me here for a second. I'm not getting into facts in the aspect that 100% guaranteed, but who in here kind of watches the surveys and the trends over the last three to five years, seven years, right? You, tell you, you know, you got Barna, you got Lifeway, you got Pew Research, you've got... Uh, probe ministries you've got you got all these organizations out here doing inventories and surveys across the nation first things that is a fact is surveys are not 100 percent accurate correct you can ask the questions a different way and get a different result uh they may not even ask questions that they should ask except i got all that i don't take them literally but i've been following them for years now and i use them as predictors trends maybe in general terms and um I think uh, we don't share because we don't know. And, and here's the thing. Uh, some, of the, some of the trends and commonalities that I've noticed over the years. Uh, what is the most important issue facing the nation? You know, you got down climate change, economy, this, that, abortion. Okay. But nowhere in there did I see anything about Christ. I got the rest of the stuff. It's It's important. What's the most important personal issues going on? Greater financial ease, better, deeper relationships, better physical health, better paying job. You know, those are the variety of answers. Nowhere did I see anything about getting to know Christ better. Well, Steve, are you stupid? No, I'm not stupid. I understand. The world's dark. I got it. It's a fallen world. We got that sermon from Bobby a while back. I understand. But just bear with me here. In 1980... More than 90% of Americans claimed to be Christian. 1980. By 2010, I'm sorry, by 1990, that had dropped to 8 out of 10. Right now, like I said, it's a predictor. Right now, about 67% of Americans identify as Christian. Now, wait for it. Wait for it. We all know just because you say you're a Christian doesn't mean you are one, Right? We, we, we got that. But now 67% that say several of these, uh, you know, there's, the percentage is different, but the commonality was it's less than 10%. This one said that of that 67%, less than 10% hold a pure gospel slash biblical worldview. <gasps> oh, what's that mean? Glad you asked. Because I, I asked the same question. I'm like, well, what the heck? Who are you to say, to say what a biblical worldview is or gospel worldview is? So I went and did my research, tried to find it. Got the reports, this, this, and looked at them all to make sure there wasn't any of these crazy questions in there. You know, like, you know, Jesus' mother really didn't give birth. You know, some, some weird, okay? Just let me read a few to you. Do absolute moral truths exist, yes or no? Somebody, thank you. Is absolute truth defined in the Bible? Did Jesus Christ live a sinless life? Is God the all-powerful and all-knowing creator of the universe, and does he still rule today? Wow, these are hard questions. Here's it now, we're getting this. Is Satan real? Oh, okay. Does a Christian have a responsibility to share his or her faith in Christ with other people? Is the Holy Spirit real or symbolic? Real. Thank you. You have a biblical worldview. According to the surveys, 
But I was expecting to find something crazy, right? And I didn't find it. I found simple questions. Basic Theology 101. So all these surveys with a little bit of variance in their numbers, the common denominator is it's less than 10% that, believe, that say yes to all these questions. I'm just blowing my mind. So maybe it's not they're afraid, it's just they don't know. Maybe they don't know. Maybe they've been taught something wrong. I'm not even going to get into the other survey I said where it said that only uh, less than half of pastors have a biblical gospel worldview. Whew, blow minds, ah, right? It's not Bobby and Wes, don't worry about that. It's not them. But, so, I don't know. I don't have the answer. What the answer is given to me is, is that I am responsible for sharing Christ. And how does that manifest itself? Well, for me today, maybe this. But for you, maybe not. Maybe it's coaching a, a, a team. Right, Mike? You know, out there working with the kids, working with the players. Maybe, Connie, it's over at work living the example, setting the example, letting others see. Maybe it's like Lyle teaching a small group. I don't know. I know Noah teaches high school. He's got a, a, a captive set of minds there. What does he do? I don't know. But we all have a place that we can do it our way for God. We just need to make sure we're aware of that and we capitalize on it. Okay, what are we doing on time here? Wes is back here. Give me this. Okay. The, no, he's not. He's not. I swear you need to know he's not. He's like, shut up. You know, let's go, man. Uh, the, uh, you know, the sad, the sad thing is, is, you know, people get, you know, they, they grow up in church that are fundamentalists and this and this. I got it. I got the same thing. But you're taught creeds, you're taught prayers, you're taught traditions, and you kind of get along this way, and you think, okay, yeah, I'm Christian. And they don't have a clue about that relationship. So they don't, maybe they don't know, okay? The harvest is plentiful. We've got to get to work. We've got to get to work, okay? And, um, you know, if we say that we're children of light, part of that is we've got to work, walk in a manner worthy, and we've got to go out there. We've got to say, hey, now, okay, I'll go ahead and say it too. When you share that, that doesn't mean you need to go get the Bible and beat somebody upside the head with it, okay? doesn't mean that you are required to stand out here in Walmart parking lot right there behind uh, the Chick-fil-A on a box yelling at all the cars that come through the intersection. And I saw a guy doing that. I'm not saying that's what it requires. What it requires is you being submissive and willing to the Holy Spirit and follow what the Holy Spirit says. And it's as simple as maybe you've been working with somebody for 10 years and they know that you're a Christian, but you've never shared Christ with them. Maybe it's your neighbor of 15 years or 10 years that you live beside that you've never offered to go help do something, be opening a door to offering Christ to them and sharing them. I don't know. But we can't walk around this world with blinders, right? We know that the gospel will offend. Don't let your attitude. Fair enough? You know, everybody's like, well, who are you to say this and this? I'm like, dude, I'm not saying that. God is. By the way, he loves you. Uh, it's okay. You're grown up. You have the power of the Holy Spirit inside you. Don't get your feelings hurt. Share Christ. Share Christ. Matthew 2, uh, 24, 4 through 14. I'm not going to read it all, but just bear with me. Jesus said, answered them, said, See to it that no one misleads you, for many will come in my name. You got all this, right? And then the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to the whole world. Read that, please. Mark it down. Matthew 24, 4 through 14. We know how the story ends. It's told to us. We know. We have that truth, we have that confidence that non-believers don't have, right? So, what are we going to do with this knowledge? I'm giving God my best and He's giving me His best. And I'm going to go out here and share it. That's the walk for me. To me, that's the walk. Are we going to share this? 
And I'll go ahead and finish this up here. John 12, 26. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will, I say again, will honor him. This is one of my favorites right here. 1 John 2, 6. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner manners he walked. If you say you have Christ and you act like it, don't be so harsh with me, Steve. I'm not. I look in the mirror and say that every day. Hey, knothead. You talk and act like it. Ugh. You know, right? I mean, we, you get frustrated with yourself, right? Paul says it. I do the things I hate doing. I know what's right, but I can't get done it. You know, wife thinks I'm mad at her a lot. I'm not. She's like, what's, what's, what's wrong with you today? And I said, I'm mad at myself. Oh, okay. So go on. Leave me alone then. All right? In James 1.22 it says, But prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. Does our walk match our talk? Only you can answer that. I just offer up today a way that I assess my walk and some facets of it. I also just want to throw out some things to consider. We live in a hateful world right now. Nobody wants to agree on anything. We all ought to be able to agree on Jesus Christ, though. And yeah, you know, Lyle drives this car and I don't, and I don't like him. What? You know, that's not, come on. We're better than that. We're better than that. Let's show everybody else how we are. We can show this to a world with love and discernment. Even though it's hostile, we can do it. We can do it. So, I just challenge you when you leave here today, look at your walk before, now, and what's it going to look like in the future. How do you want it to look? God's given you the guidance and the instructions. You can wander off and stick with Him. And I dare say sometimes He'll even carry you. You know, I've been carried a bunch. But you commit to that, your life will never be the same. And, you know, if you don't know Christ, if you're one person in this room and you don't know Christ and you've been faking it, I pray the Holy Spirit will convict you today. I really do. Because I love you. But God loves you more. If you've been faking it, don't quit faking it. Just come to the Lord. Say, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm here. I want to give you my best. Because I know you're going to give me yours. And just make that commitment today and be done with it. Start your walk. Trust me, it's a tough road. Man, what waits at the end, right? Our fellowship with Christ in His glory and for His glory. Let's pray. Lord, thank You for loving us. Thank You for Your grace. Thank You for Your mercy and Your provision. We ask, Lord, through the Holy Spirit that You would repair us, refine us, renew us, Lord, so that we may serve You and walk in a manner worthy of our calling and a manner worthy for You. Help us to love like You love. Help us to remind others of Your hope and Your great love. Help us to choose patience over anger, kindness over criticism. Continue to perfect Your work in each of us, Lord, and shape our character to be more holy like You. We ask these things, Lord, and we give You all the honor, praise, and we ask it in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Please stand.